I good? Sounds like I'm good. Cool. Okay. It's good to see you all again. I always love preaching Sunday school, and I just love being up here, being able to talk to you guys. And I'd just like to preface this with uh, a quick note. Uh, with the recent presidential election, there's been a lot of political energy in the nation right now. And I just wanted to talk a quick second and give this preface because I'm not trying to lead you in any direction. I'm not going to try to make you Republican today. I'm not going to try to make you Democrat today. I'm not pushing a political agenda. I want to push God's agenda. That's the plan for today. So as I go through this, I'm just going to warn you, I am talking. I'm going to talk today a little bit about voting and why it's important, especially for our nation, that we do vote. Not about what per se we vote for. That's not what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about the general idea of voting. And I just don't want anybody to think that I'm coming up here red or blue. I don't want people to get misunderstood. So let's go ahead and open with prayer. Uh, oh, Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to talk to the congregation today. And Lord, I pray you just please give me the ton of fire that you gave Isaiah, Lord, and just please cleanse me and wash me. Forgive me of my sins right now. And Lord, I pray I can just deliver this message with uh, clarity and purity. Lord, thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. So if you will, turn with me uh, to Leviticus 26. Leviticus chapter 26. And you will see today that there is actually life in Leviticus. As we go through Leviticus, often our eyes get a little bit heavy through all the hear ye's, hear ye's. But let me tell you what, there's actually life in Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 26 we're going to read verses 27 through 33, so if you'll bear with me, would you stand for the reading of God's Word? If you can't, we understand. We understand. I'm using my wife's Bible, which is small print, and I am blind today, so forgive me. <laughs> chapter, chapter 26, verse 27. And if ye will not for all this hearken unto me, but walk contrary unto me, then I will walk contrary unto you also in fury. And I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. And ye shall eat the flesh of your sons, and the flesh of your daughters shall ye eat. And I will destroy your high places, and cut down your images, and cast your carcasses upon the carcasses of your idols. And my soul shall abhor you. And I will make your cities waste, and bring your sanctuaries unto desolation. And I will not smell the savor of your sweet odors, and I will bring the land into desolation. And your enemies which dwell therein shall be astonished at it. And I will scatter you among the heathen, and will draw out a sword after you. And your land shall be desolate, and your cities waste. You may all be seated. So why open up on such a depressing piece of scripture, Harlan? That seems like a great idea. <laughs> So God says, if you don't follow me, I'm basically going to take everything away. You're going to eat your children. Your carcasses will lay in front of the carcasses of your gods. And I will not be with you. That seems like a very strong point to start on. <laughs> and it can be very scary sometimes because we can get into the thought process of, oh, no, if I slip up even a little bit, God's not going to be with me and I'm going to start eating my kids. No, no, that, that's not what we're saying. But what I, we're saying here is more of on a national level. He's talking about, here's what's going to happen. And this is all the way back in Leviticus, back when uh, Moses is taking the children of Israel through the wilderness. And later on, we're going to go all the way up to when they are taken through Babylon later on. But for right now, there seems to be a common belief in my generation specifically that voting in this country does not matter or that one person's vote does not matter. However, I would argue it does. It matters a great deal. It shows what values the country is moving towards and holds, and the direction that it will go to. This is not a politically motivated message, but a spiritually motivated one. And I'd like to take a look at some spiritual reasons why we should vote, no matter who you're voting for or what you're voting for, but why we should vote. Listen, God not only judges the individual, but also the nation. We see that right here. He says, if you will walk contrary to me, I will walk contrary to you in what? Fury. You'll know when God is not walking with you. And we see that in America today. 
He says, you will eat the flesh of your children. I like to reiterate that because we'll come back to that. And I will destroy your high places. He'll get rid of your gods that you so love to worship, whether that be uh, the, uh, the God of Islam or, or B the Buddha or the TV or your phone. He's going to get rid of that, kill it, and perhaps you may fall in front of it if this is the direction of which your nation decides to go. Now this seems like an interesting thing to tell to the Israelites because at this time it seemed like with Moses, they, the Israelites had a say. Remember the time when Moses was uh, leading them through the wilderness and they were complaining, oh, we don't have any food. We just have this rotten manna from heaven. Ugh, so terrible. We make it into cakes and it's fresh daily. We need more. He would have us starve. We wish we went back to Egypt where they had all these wonderful meat pots and oh, savory food. And so what does Moses do? Moses doesn't just shut them down and tell them how wicked they are. He goes to the Lord and he prays. He says, Lord, my people, they're hungry. What does the Lord do? He delivers them what, fowls of the air. He gives them a little bit different. He has mercy on them. So it seems to me like the people of Israel came together and started complaining. And they got a little bit more. But we see that that doesn't really help it, does it? We see that when we get a little bit more and we get a little bit more, we take an inch, we, get them, well, we give them ourselves an inch, we'll take a mile. So it seems to me that the Israelites had a bit of a choice. They just chose wrong. Voting allows for an opportunity to share our faith. You know how many times this week alone at work or just walking about with my friends, I've been asked, oh, who'd you vote for? Listen, if you've got an unsaved friend and they ask who you vote for, why don't you open up with, I voted for the most godly position of which I can go for. And this is an awesome segue into the gospel because then you can share some of that key doctrine of which you subscribe to through the voting choice of you, that you have. Now, I will argue that in the past years, our candidates have been perhaps less than savory on both sides, right? They, they haven't been the, pro, the perfect American dream living individuals. They've been, what, are they, what have they been? Sinners, just like the rest of us. So we can't sit here and say, I'm not going to vote because he's wicked and, or she's wicked and she's done this and he's done that. I'm not going to vote. Well, the problem is that doesn't get us anywhere. If you don't vote for what you believe in, it's a vote for what you don't. Think about that. You got 50 people who voted last year. One vote will decide the decision, will decide who gets the, the house or the office. One person on either side says, I'm not voting. I'm tired of all this. Guess what happens to them? The other side wins. Now it's 50 versus 49. That's how quick it is. And that's how this last presidential candidacy went, people. It was that close. That close. Most states were either 45 to 53 or even almost 50 and 50. It is that close. That's why your vote matters. There are times where, you know, there are landslides and we can get a little discouraged. But voting is a spiritual practice. It can be a spiritual practice. It can be a leap off into the gospel. Number three, Christians should always be fighting for what is right, especially on a national level. If you have an apathy towards your government and what they're doing, and you say, oh, the Lord will handle that. Listen, maybe the Lord's handling it through you and the ability to vote. That might be a thing. Hmm. Let's see. Leviticus 11.44. I'm going to fire these off. You can look them up with me. I don't know if I'll have enough time to get through it, but I just want to fire them off, so I'm going to go quick. 11, uh, Levit Leviticus 11.44. For I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Number two, Leviticus 45, Le Leviticus 11:45. For I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your gods, ye to be your God. Ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 7. Sanctify yourselves therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 20, 26. And ye shall be holy unto me, for I the Lord am holy, and have severed you from the uh, other people, that ye should be mine. And this one is important. Leviticus 19, 2. Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel and say unto them, Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. We take this verse 
the verse in 1 Peter 1.16, because we are part of the new church age, and we look at that, those words, be ye holy, for I am holy. And we apply it to the individual. And it seems to be that's where that stops. But that word, I'm going to put on my brother Rob Harding hat real quick, because we haven't seen him in a little bit. That word ye, that's addressing multiple people. That's a multitude of people. Ye, in 19.2, is addressing a nation, making national choices. The nation of Israel, be ye holy, for I am holy. Now, we can take it and be on the individual level of, I'm going to be holy like the Lord is holy because I worship the Lord God. I'm not going to drink, I'm not going to smoke, I'm not going to chew, and I'm not going to go with girls that do. But as a nation, perhaps we should take that and adopt that as well in our policies and our moral understandings. Because if we look at First Peter 1.16, look at how it's written. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. He's referencing all of those. And all of these other pieces of scripture were in reference to who? Moses? No. Aaron? Caleb? No, the nation of Israel. They were in reference to the nation of Israel. Nation of Israel, be ye holy, for I am holy. I am, I am the Lord your God. That's what he said. Jesus references it, references it in the Gospels as well. So with the recent presidential election, we've seen more people becoming politically charged, and this is a wonderful thing. I think this is awesome. We've seen more young people voting than ever, mostly because of how social media works and, and the buzzwords we have and all the short-form content that politicians can be pushed out. I love the idea of young people voting. The only downside to that is that young people are voting. So... We don't have the smartest or most developed individuals right now <laughs> pushing towards what we want to go towards. So that can lead us to problems like the national demonizing of Israel in support of their enemies. Right? That's a big problem with the Palestinians in our, in our campuses right now, the young folk. You know, you don't see, you see some older individuals out there, but a lot of them are in their 20s to 30s right now, and even younger. And they're over there from the river to the sea. They don't even, they've never seen the river or the sea. They're, they're preaching it. They're parroting it. Who do you think is teaching it? Probably the colleges, more than likely. That's the way our nation is going. That's the way we voted for, for the past four years, and then the other four years before, or eight years before that, this is the way we wanted to go. This is because we voted for this, right? We wanted a mixing pot. We want all sorts of individuals to become, to come together and have a discussion. But what's happening is that discussion is starting to turn a little bit violent. Next up, we have the rise of abortion. This, I feel, is, not, is a massive point that my country or my kind of fighting for it. It gets me kind of teared up. At this point in writing this message last night, there's a world counter that you can look up that counts like think water, cups of water's drink, or like money spent on the deficit. Do you know what they have listed under death? They have deaths of individuals in the entire world. They have deaths from drowning. They have deaths from all sorts of manners. You know what they have listed under health? Abortion. That's the way the world looks at abortion. It's health. That's so backwards, isn't it? The most backwards thing. They will call evil good and good evil. It's health care. It's not murder. I disagree. It's more like a, akin to assisted suicide somewhat, or maybe what the, <laughs> what the Israelites were doing with Baal, sacrificing their children on fiery hands for success. And more are coming. I heard on the news the other day that UK, in the UK, there is talks, they haven't passed a law, of maybe making a silent prayer outside of an abortion clinic illegal. Now, many people are saying, oh, this goes against the right for religion and things like that. But the fact that it's even a question is scary. They can't stand outside of an abortion clinic and pray silently without people being like, maybe we should make this illegal. Come on now. Okay, 
That's the direction the UK is going. Maybe the America would never do that. Oh, you think so? <laughs> Have you seen what happens outside of our abortion clinics? It's a war. There's screaming, there's yelling, there's fighting, there's cursing. I wish that our Christians would go over there and pray silently. Instead, we have Christians holding signs, yelling at the poor women who have to make this decision or feel they're pushed into this decision. What, what are we doing? What have we done to help this, this point that our, our nation is going towards? Well, for one, we can start voting. We can vote for our nation to go in a different direction, vote against the policies of abortion. And I feel confident in saying that from the pul pulpit, that we should vote against abortion. Amen. If I'm wrong, strike me down, Lord. Take me away now. And the general turning away of, from God by our nation. I remember when I was in school, we said the Pledge of Allegiance. I don't remember it now, unfortunately. <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> but we said the Pledge, Pledge of Allegiance. And eventually that made some people uncomfortable. And so we eventually got rid of it. And then eventually the American flag got pulled out of our schools. And then eventually people could, had to stop bringing their Bibles to class. You can get one from the library. You know what? That thing's dusty. It's old. It's never touched. They keep one in the library for the strict purpose of being able to say that they support all religions, but I guarantee you the second they could, they'd pull it down. They'd get rid of it. You know, they have the Koran in the, in the library too. They have that there. They have uh, the writings for Buddha in the library as well. They have that there. They'll keep those there. But it seems to me every year it seems like there seems to be some pushback against Christianity. So as a nation, let's look at ourselves from God's lens. Are we going in the direction of God? I don't, I don't really agree yet. I mean, with this af after this presidential election, there's, there's, there's wait to see, but I don't think that the people in the red suits or the people in the blue suits will take us closer to God. I don't think that they'll... They are the deciding factor there. I think that the people of the, of the nation are the deciding factor of the direction the nation will take. It's not about whether President Trump takes us towards God. It's about whether we voted to go towards God. That's what it is, right? It's not about whether Kamala Harris will take us closer to God. It's about whether we decided we wanted to. So let me give you a quick summary of Numbers 14 13 through 38. You can read it real quick as I summarize. Moses intercedes between the Lord and Israel, referencing that the Egyptians, if they see that Israel has fallen and all people died in the wilderness, that that will bring a bad name unto the Lord. That's his defense. The Lord is saying, I'm going to end these people. They're, they're wicked, they're hard-necked, and he looks at Moses and he says, I'm going to make a new nation out of you. And no, Moses says, please, no. <laughs> Let's, let's think about this for a minute, not like the Lord hasn't already. Don't you love when people are like, oh, i got to help the Lord out. Oh, no, the Lord's overreacting again. I better talk to him, you know. It's almost like we can take the power away. It's almost like God didn't think that Moses would come to him and beg for the people like he was a good leader or something. It's almost like he didn't put him in place. Did, what, did he? I'm sure he did. <laughs> So he goes to the people and he brings this preface and the Lord's decision is to cause the people, he says, okay, Moses, the people are going to wander for 40 years and then their children are going to go and take the Holy Land. And all this is because of a couple of spies came back and they said, it's not good there. It's scary. I believe there was only two spies that came back that said, it's great. Let's go do it. Let's get it. A minority. But guess who won? The majority vote. They took a majority vote of fear and said, maybe we should wait. The Lord would have it, <coughs> sorry, the Lord would have it that we should die in the wilderness. And they all got afraid and they decided not to go. And we see later on in Numbers 14, 39 through 45, what they decide when the Lord tells them what he's going to do about their decision. He says, okay. You don't want to go? You're going to stay in the wilderness for 40 years. You seem to like it here so much, you know, with your children starving and dying and you falling into cracks in the earth and the weather and the implements and you see all these wonderful things and I have told you that you can have them, but you still don't want them. So go ahead and have it. It's almost like, and forgive, pardon my language, 
It's almost like in the old 1950s films when they catch their kids smoking cigarettes. Smoke a whole carton of cigarettes! And they get sick, and then, you know, that whole story. So he says, you want the wilderness? Fine, you'll die there. You'll live for 40, I'll make you wander for 40 years, and your children will take it. And then the people of Israel say, oh no, we don't want that either. So what do they do in Numbers 14, 39 through 45? And Moses told these sayings unto all the children of Israel, and the people mourned greatly. And they rose up early in the morning and got them up into the top of the mountain, saying, Lo, we be here, and we'll go up into the place which the Lord hath promised, for we have sinned. Look at that. They're told, they're, they're judged, and they're given their, their, their judgment, and then they're like, No, we're going to go and take the Holy Land now, now that there's, you know, consequences. Uh-oh. We're going to go, and, and you could call this kind of repentance, but I don't think it is. I think this is more a, a, a greedy nation deciding we don't want to do this either, so we're going to do our own thing. And Moses, and Moses said, Wherefore now do ye transgress the commandment of the Lord? But it shall not prosper. So Moses is running after him. He's like trying to stop him. Go not up for the... Um, for the Lord is not among you that ye be not smitten before your enemies. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and ye shall fall by the sword, because ye are turned away from the Lord. Therefore, the Lord will not be with you. But they presumed to go up unto the hilltop. You ever heard that song, I want that mountain? I want that mountain. I want that mountain. That mountain that my Lord has given me. Wouldn't it be ironic if they all sang that song, going up and getting slaughtered, making the Lord look a little funny? Perhaps they should have just listened to the Lord when he said, you're going to wander for 40 years. Perhaps they should have said these old lines, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. That's true repentance. Repentance is accepting what God's saying and saying, yes, Lord, we will. Perhaps, perhaps their lives would have been more blessed in the wilderness at that point if they would have just said, yes, Lord. So they go up. To the hilltop. Nevertheless, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. Sure that God is not with them. Because we see that many times with David, don't we? When they go to battle, they bring the Ark of the Covenant with them. When they're moving around, they bring the Ark of the Covenant with them. He traveled through the wilderness with them. That's where, that's where the Lord is, the judgment seat of the Lord. He did not go with them this day. Then the Amalekites came down, and the Canaanites, which dwelt in that hill and smote them, and discomfited them, even unto Hormah. Funny how what God said would happen, happened. They had to test it out. They had to find out for themselves. Out of fear, the Israelites finally decided to go up into the land that the Lord had given them, and take it, hoping for the best. In a majority vote, they decided the best thing to do right now is to follow the Lord, and what He wants is best for us. Let's go take the Holy Land, forgetting completely what the Lord had already said. Because of this, you will be 40 years in the wilderness. They were warned by Moses that their fates were sealed, but they were stiff-necked and hard people. This caused their deaths and even more fear to spread among the nation of Israel. And as they told stories to their children for that 40 years, Perhaps their children only listen to the parts where they're like, but the Lord said, you guys will take it. And so that's why they went up with Joshua later on. Listen, one good reason to vote now is because it might help your great-grandchildren with voting later. If you just sit aside and you let whatever the nation goes, it's almost like <laughs> taping down the throttle on your motorcycle and just... You're not in control. That's someone else's problem now. Whoever that thing's name is in. Oh, wait, it's me? <laughs> Yikes. You've got to be careful. When we're voting, it's going to fall onto our children. When we make these votes, we may suffer short term, but there is suffering long term. And if you vote outside of what the will of God is, He may make you to wander. He may even cause you to go back to Leviticus or Main text, eat your children. He may put your carcasses in front of your car God's carcasses. He may make you to wander. He may make you lost. So, with that being said, I have enough time. 
Praise the Lord. I would like to show you out of the Bible what happens to a nation that does not decide to follow God. And I'm under the agreeance that sometimes we need to just read a chapter of the Bible from the pulpit and let it sit. So turn with me, if you will, to Lamentations. Lamentations, chapter 4. Lamentations, chapter 4. Oh, my bad. (laughs) I turned to Ezekiel. Here I am. (laughs) Small print. Lamentations chapter 4. We'll begin, if I can hold your attention. How is the gold become dim? How is the most fine gold changed? The stones of the sanctuary are poured out in the top of every street. The precious sons of Zion, comparable to fine gold, how are they esteemed as earthen pitchers? The work of the hands of the potter... Even the sea monsters drew out the breast. They give suck to their young ones. The daughter of my people has become cruel like the ostriches in the wilderness. The tongue of the suckling child cleaveth to the roof of his mouth for thirst. The young children ask bread and no man breaketh it unto them. They that did feed delicately are desolate in the streets. They that were brought up in scarlet embrace dunghills. For the punishment of the iniquity of the daughter of my people is greater than the punishment of the sin of Sodom that was overthrown as in a moment. And no hand stayed on her. Her Nazarites were purer than snow. They were whiter than milk. They were more ruddy in body than rubies. Their polishing was of sapphire. Their visage is blacker than a coal. They are not known in the streets. Their skin cleaveth to their bones. It is withered. It is become like a stick. They that be slain with the sword are better than they that be slain with hunger. For these pine away, stricken through for want of the fruits of the field. The hands of the pitiful women have sought in their own children. They were their meat in de- the destruction of the daughter of my people. The Lord hath accomplished his fury. He hath poured out his fierce anger and hath kindled a fire in Zion, and it hath devoured the nations, the foundations thereof. The kings of the earth and all the inhabitants of the world would not have believed that the adversary and the enemy would have entered into the gates of Jerusalem. For the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests that have shed the blood of the just in the midst of her, they have wandered as blind men in the streets. They have polluted themselves with blood so that men could not touch their garments. They cried unto them, Depart ye, it is unclean, depart ye, touch not. When they fled away and wandered, they said among the heathen, They shall no more sojourn there. The anger of the Lord hath divided them. He will no more regard them. They respected not the persons of the priests. They favored not the elders. As for us, our eyes as yet failed for our vain help. In our watching, we have watched for a nation that could not save us. They hunt our steps that cannot, we cannot go in our streets. Our end is near. Our days are fulfilled, for our end is come. Our persecutors are swifter than the eagles of the heaven. They pursued a, 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 us upon the mountains. They laid wait for us in the wilderness. The breath of our nostrils, the anointed of the Lord, was taken in their pits, of whom we said, under his shadow we shall live among the heathen. Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, that dwellest in the land of Uz. The cup also shall pass through unto thee. Thou shalt be drunken and shalt make thyself naked. The punishment of thine iniquity is accomplished. O daughter of Zion, he will no more carry thee away into captivity. He will visit thine iniquity. O daughter of Edom, he will discover thy sins. This is a very powerful piece of scripture about the fall of Jerusalem to Babylon. 
the final taking away of the Jews. It paints a picture of poor, destitute men. Poor, destitute men. Bones and skin, that's all that's left. Women so hungry, they're eating their children. This is what Leviticus was talking about. This is what they were warned about generations before. I pray that America, America doesn't fall into that same problem that they did in Lamentations. I pray we don't read Lamentations someday and look around and say, oh no, we're that. I want to be, I want to be holy like God is holy. I want our nation to be holy like God is holy. So I'm going to vote for our nation to be holy like God is holy. So as we go forward, I would like to remind you that there is one way to turn a nation around, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. The death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior that saved us from sin, that defeated death, and by believing in him, thou shalt be saved. The first step is to get saved before you can make a godly decision. That's the best godly decision. That's the one that's going to affect your life the most. The second step after you get saved, make, make godly decisions. When you get that ballot, and the ballot says... Should abortion be allowed in Washington? Up to, what, up to what term? Make the decision. I want you to pray about it. And I think it's a good time to talk about this because all is said and done, there is no bias here. There's some bias against abortion, I'll admit that. But please, pray for our nation. Vote righteously. And continue to serve the Lord. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for this message. Thank you for giving me the strength I needed for this message. Lord, I pray this message reaches the, right, reaches the right individuals. Lord, I pray you please just watch over us and protect us as we go about our day and help keep us thoughtful about your word. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen.